If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. And today we're going to be talking about a third intestinal coccidian parasite. Now remember, we've already gone over cryptosporidium and cyclospora, and today we're going to talk about a less common parasite is called Cystoisospora belli, or you may remember it as Isospora belli. Joining me, as always, to talk about parasites is parasitology teacher and author, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary, and welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. Yes, ma'am. What is Cystoisospora? Okay, it's a small, it's a protozoan parasite, so a single-celled organism, and as you pointed out, quite closely related to the more familiar cryptosporidium. It causes a diarrheal-like illness. Okay, and where's, where in the world is it found? It can be found anywhere in the world, although it certainly is more common in the tropics and the subtropics, so places where the weather is warm and the organism can flourish year-round. Okay. Now, can you talk about the life cycle of this parasite and how people become infected with it? Yes, it has rather a complicated life cycle. If you swallow the infective stage, it's called the oocyst, it contains some sporozoites which exist in the intestine and invade intestinal cells. And there these sporozoites start to multiply. They can multiply until they burst out of the cell invade new cells and again they go through us in a stage of asexual multiplication eventually they switch to sexual multiplication which gives rise then to the oocysts themselves which are passed in the stool this life cycle is very very similar to the cryptosporidium life cycle the major difference being that cryptosporidium oocysts are infective as soon as they are passed in the stool whereas isospora appears to need a couple of days at least in the environment before the oocysts are infective. Okay, and you mentioned previously that uh, one of the symptoms, of course, is diarrhea. Is there anything else we need to know about the symptomology of infection with this parasite? Yeah, it's kind of a typical diarrheal illness that we see with both bacteria and protozoa, actually. You have the diarrhea, perhaps quite watery, perhaps fairly prolonged, Abdominal, abdominal pain and cramps, some nausea and vomiting, perhaps even a bit of fever. You will get over it eventually. Most people will get over it by themselves. Okay. Now, how is this parasite diagnosed and how does it appear microscopically? It's quite an interesting parasite microscopically. It looks like an eye. So the oocyst is sort of eye-shaped. And with a sporocyst, the immature ones will only have one sporocyst in them, so it actually looks like a pupil in the middle of the oocyst. But they can be challenging to spot in a stool specimen because the outer wall of the oocyst is very, very thin and delicate. And if the lighting on your microscope isn't set just right, then you don't even see it. It becomes invisible. So they're quite exciting and challenging to spot in the lab. We do our usual... Um, concentration method on stool specimens in the lab. In other words, we use a method to, to uh, get rid of most of the fecal garbage and stuff that we don't want to look at and concentrate the parasites so that we can see them in a wet mount. Now, I can remember back in the day that we used to use a modified acid fast to assist with this. Is this still a common procedure? 
Well, it's not a common procedure, but it certainly does work. They do stain quite well with oramine stain or with uh, something like a saffronin acid fast stain. Unfortunately, it's not practical to do that on every stool specimen. It's simply too labor intensive. So um, we do rely on the wet mount mostly to see it. Okay. Now, how is this parasite treated? It actually can be treated with trimethoprim sulfa, a common antibiotic. So it's, it differs from cryptosporidium in that way as well. It, it responds quite well to antibiotic treatment. Um, it, it, does this parasite like cryptosporidium, is, is, there a, uh, is this seen a lot in immunocompromised type patients? I wouldn't say that it's seen more in them than in the rest of the population, but it certainly can be a more serious infection sure. because their immune systems don't tend to fight it off as well as a healthy immune system does. Yeah, I, I think I think in my past life in, in the parasitology lab, that was one of the concerns was isospora in HIV patients. Yes, of course it's in most North American labs, you wouldn't see isospora, uh, sorry, cystoisospora very often, maybe once or twice a year at the most, and it yeah. causes great excitement when we see it. Yeah, it is quite yeah. rare. Um, yes. Any specific prevention recommendations well, you get it by eating contaminated food or drinking contaminated water, usually. Because the, the oocysts aren't infective, usually directly from person to person, hand washing uh, in terms of uh, avoiding catching it, hand washing isn't as effective. It's more about paying attention to the food and the water and making sure that they are clean. But of course, hand washing is always important if, if you could possibly be passing something on to someone else. And, of course, my last and always my favorite question of every interview, do you have any interesting stories about this intestinal coccidia? Well, I think the most fascinating thing about this that, that I can find is its name. Its name seems to have come from interesting origins, and it keeps changing. So, actually, the, the uh, species name, Belli, or perhaps it should be pronounced Belli, it comes from back in the in the times of the First World War when a fellow by the name of Wenyan named it and he named it Belly because he saw it in a lot of military troops, people who had been to Egypt or Palestine. And the word belly comes from a I believe it's a Latin term which actually refers to something causing a declaration of war. Mm. So that's why he named it that. I don't think he thought that the parasite itself was causing any war. He just <laughs> associated it with the war. And then, of course, about five or six years ago, the name was changed from isospora to cystoisospora. And those of us who have been calling it isospora forever are having a very hard time making the adjustment. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. All right. Well, thank you once again, Rosemary, for your time and your vast expertise. I appreciate it. My pleasure, as always.